Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Plymouth Congregational Church. Maybe a teeny bit. I mean, can we turn it down just a teeny bit? You think it's a little loud? Right. Well, welcome out there. I think that's better, right? Can you hear me in the back? All right. What? Turn it up a teeny bit. <laughs> How about this? Can you hear me now? That sounds good. All right. Yes. Yeah, right. We're going to vote on it. We vote on everything. Well, welcome everybody to Plymouth Congregational Church on this amazingly beautiful day. It is fall. It is fall. One of the things that we say here at Plymouth is that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. And we invite you to join us for the fellowship hour out in the beautiful Cloister Garden. Grab one of our classic cups of coffee with ice cream in it. One of the things we say about fellowship hour is that we... And the service continues where we get to know each other, an important part of our faith, getting to know each other and growing our faith. Also, uh, I remind folks that we have the friendship register in the, in the pews, and whether this is your first time at the church or you've been coming for your entire life, we invite you to just let us know you're here. And in particular, if, you would, um, if you're not getting our This Week at Plymouth emails, put your email in here, and we'll start sending you This Week at Plymouth. Um, Also, for folks who are new or relatively new to the church, we invite you to join us for our prospective member gathering. We're going to be gathering right over there, and it's called Plymouth Hall. It's just the first building to the right, and we're going to do it at about 11.15, and over the course of that hour, you're going to meet some folks, and you're going to learn more about Plymouth, and we'll talk about the the new membership process. It's a really a, a fun a fun gathering. So that's at about 11.15. So maybe grab a cup of coffee and we'll head over to uh, Plymouth Hall. Um, I have to give a shout out to the, um, well, thank you to Bobby and, and, and Walt Orth for hosting the Women's Luau on Wednesday night. I was a witness of this. You may wonder why I was there. I was there because Walt and I were the, uh, uh, the, the bartenders. But so we had a special view, the pig roast, the whole thing. It was fantastic. So well done, the women's group, just getting to know each other. I also want to give a shout out to our emergency, Cobb Family Emergency Response Fund. A group of us went over to um, Port Charlotte yesterday and we did a few things. We visited a church where we're probably going to connect with them and give a gift to help get their preschool going, uh, at reopen, especially the playground with the kids. Then we went to another church where we um, did significant work handing out food uh, over the course of much of the day. And we also learned, I learned a great deal about the difference between this storm, Ian, and other storms, the water damage is very different. And what we did yesterday, the need for food we found significant. The number of cars, it was a never-ending number of cars lined up to get food. Much more to say about this, and we won't get into the details right now, but I invite you to look for Rich Bard. Rich, why don't you stand up? Where are you? Rich is is the chair of our uh, emergency response fund. Rich is going to be in fellowship hour before he comes over to Plymouth Hall, whatever, it's complicated. But look for Rich and ask him about it, and there's so much to say, or ask me, it was a great day. Um, uh, Thank you, um, uh, everybody who went, Um, and we'll be doing more of this. We want to continue to make a difference in the wake of Hurricane Ian. Um, A few things to announce that are upcoming, we've got the Christmas boxes, our annual Christmas boxes, where we... Uh, help um, orphans and, and out of at the um, Family Resource Center, and um, you can start to sign up for a box next Sunday. So just thinking a, a, a week ahead, you can sign up, start signing up, and there's th- some of those details are in the insert to the order of worship. Also on November 5th, the youth are going to be doing a rebuilding together. So if you're a youth, a parent of a youth, you're watching online, whatever it is. You can sign up. Um, it's easy enough, or let Pastor Moira or I know that you want to be part of November 5th rebuilding together. The biblical archaeology is postponed. Okay, so we don't have a date yet for that. So that one will change that. And then here's another big one. We got pickleball. We're bringing back pickleball on the basketball court, and that's on November 13th in all church. Uh, and we're going to have food to eat. It's going to be another fun after church event. 
One other, uh, two other th things to briefly mention. The inserts to the order of worship, the yellow piece of paper. You can nominate others or anyone to be on one of our boards and committees, and the details or, or basic summary of what each board and committee does is on here. We rely on you to show us your interest in being part of uh, the various ways we serve God through the congregation. And then also I want to let remind folks that we are... Our men's Bible study, we're last uh, uh, Tuesday morning, it's at 8 a.m., we've been doing it on, via Zoom for the last long time. Well, last Tuesday was the first one in person, we're at Green Street, so Green Street, if you just show up Green Street Cafe at 8 a.m., uh, I will, will be, the men's uh, Bible group will continue. A lot happens, a lot happens in our lives. A lot happens in the world. It's a complicated, complicated world, and we are complicated, complicated beings. But what we gather to do today, in a sense, it's the simplest and most important thing we can do. Let us worship the Lord together.
turn to our bulletins and call one another to worship. This is the dwelling place of God. Let us come before the Lord in humility. Let us sing for joy to the living God. Let us worship and rejoice. Please be seated. Let's join one another in the prayer of invocation and our Lord's Prayer. Lord of mercy and grace, you are a wellspring of joy and strength. As we worship, may we seek your face and sing your praises. Draw near to us, pour your spirit upon us, that with the words upon our lips and the witness of our lives, we might exalt you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. First lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Psalms, and I'm going to ask my young friends to pay attention to this psalm, because we're going to talk about it in just a minute. And in it, this psalm talks about something called the Valley of Baca. And Baca comes from the word that means tears and weeping. And that these were people who got up out of their homes. They wanted so badly to go to the temple in Jerusalem. And if you look around, you see how big this church is, with all the stones and the roof. The temple in Jerusalem was way bigger than this. And that was the place where they really felt all of God's people could come together and sing and come into God's house. So they left their houses and they walked and walked and walked and walked. And the journey was very hard, going through hard and difficult places. And when they started to get tired or lonely or start to, their spirits would get sad, they would sing. And as they were walking on this pilgrimage, this would be one of the songs they would sing to build their spirits and help them remember where they were going. They were going to go and be in God's special house to worship and be together worshiping God and be in God's presence. So together, we're going to pray this psalm. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. We're going to invite my young friends to meet me up on the steps. Wow, I love the ears. I love your ears. Hi, everybody. Gosh, everybody looks so fancy today. I love this. Were you listening to that psalm? Yeah? Did you hear what the choir was singing when we first started? Did you hear what the, the, when they were singing called the introit, that beautiful music that gets us ready to worship? They were talking about God being almighty and powerful, the Lord of hosts. God in that, that song and in this psalm is big and creates the universe and is so big and powerful when the people wanted to build a place to worship God. Do you think they built just like a little teeny tiny place? No, they built this bigger than this, way bigger than this because it was going to be God's house for God that was so big and great and powerful. But if you listened in the psalm to go into God's house, there was such a big place, this big and powerful God. They talk about something called the sparrow. You see the sparrow? You see how little the sparrow is? About the right size for a sparrow. It's just this teeny tiny, we'll show it for the choir too, this teeny tiny, the even God who's so powerful cares about the teeny tiniest little bird. The bird is going to be welcome in God's house. And even the bird is going to sing when everybody comes together. 
to worship. So when the people were leaving their homes and going on this long walk, they really got tired. I mean, it's a long, hard walk. How did you get to church this morning? My car? How did you get to church this morning? I know some people come on their bicycles. You came in the car? You ride your bike? How long did it take? Like five days? No? Got here pretty quick, right? Right? Did you walk? It's nice to be able to walk. It would be like for these people as if right now we decided we were going to start walking to go to church and we'd get there next Sunday. And we would have to walk that whole time and it was going to be hot and rocky and tired and we might get like really discouraged. And if you look, when they talk about that valley I was talking about, I brought a picture. I'm going to show it to you all first because it's a little closer. It's, wow, it's a desert. And to see the mountains with nothing. I'm going to see if maybe the people in the congregation can see, right? This valley in the desert with no trees and no water. And this psalmist did something very special. When they, this psalmist writes something that's called poetry. And in poetry, you know how you draw a picture because you're trying to make, like, draw a valley? or it helps somebody understand something. Poets do that, but they use words so that our minds and our imaginations paint a picture. And the psalmist, when he was talking, or she, was talking about the valley of Baca, this valley of weeping, that sometimes we feel like we are walking through a place like this, not really in a desert, but just we're really sad. Like bad things happen to us, sad things happen to us, or our friends are being mean to us, and just feel like it just goes on and on and on, and we get very discouraged. That's what it means to be feeling like just in this valley where you're so sad. And the people who were going through this place and this journey, what they wanted more than anything was to get to the temple to be with everyone. Look out there and see all the people who are here. That together, even when we're feeling sad, there are lots of people out there that are feeling very sad today. There are lots of people who are feeling very discouraged because the hard things are happening for a very long time. And they come together and they feel like they're in God's presence. Like when we all come together and we pray and we sing, we really can feel like God is with us. That's what the people in the psalm wanted. That's where they felt good. they were with God. But you know something? You know one of the things that Jesus told us? That God is also where? Not just in this house. Inside all of us. So what happens is we all come in here and we get to be like the people who are going to the temple. But then we go outside into the world and you know who goes with us? God goes with us. God doesn't stay in here. right? God goes out into the world. And there are people right now who are going through really hard things. You can talk to Pastor Al and Mr. Cobb and Mr. Bard and Mr. Thielen. They went over to the other side of our state and there are people who have no homes. No homes. That means children, too. Like, if you think of your room and all the cool stuff that's in your room, for those children, you know what? It's gone. Literally gone. Their favorite toys, their favorite pillow, all their cool treasures that's in their room, their special place. And I'm going to tell you something. This is going to take a very long time to help those children feel better. But when we go out into the world, we can do it. We can help the people who are going through something hard. I'm going to show you one of the ways we can take God with us. And it may seem look, like a little funny. Do you know what this is? you know what these are? There's a doggy and a kitty and soccer balls. I'm going to show you. I'll give you a hint if I do something. Can you see? It's a pillowcase. And on the day where you all are playing pickleball, the 7th and 8th graders are going to come. And we're going to put pillows in here. And you know what? There's a really wonderful lady in our church. Her name is Mrs. Conaty. She made all of these for us. And we're going to make like 75 or 100 pillows in a special pillowcase, in a special bag that's going to go to Chapman Partnership for children who have no what? They don't have a home or a room or pillows. So we are going to do that. And when we do that, we send God's love straight right to them. I'm going to show you something else. This is another way we can share God's love. A uh, paintbrush. Do um, you know who's going to do this? No. Our youth. There is a family who lives very close to us, and they're having a hard time, and we're going to go and help fix up their house. So our teenagers are going to go, and we're going to be in here together, and we're going to feel God's presence, and we're going to take God's love right down the street to our neighbors to help them feel better. Hey, guys, let me show you another way we can show God's love. What are these? These are pretty elegant. I could wear these like to a party, right? Like for Ellen's. 
even better. Do you see them? These are my work gloves. These are, these are my work gloves. And you know what? The people from this church are going to go all this way back over to the West Coast and help the people whose yards need cleaned up because they have stuff everywhere and their houses need fixed up. But you know what also needs fixed up? Not just their houses and their yards. You know what needs fixed up for them? Why? Their, their spirit. Because they are going to go through a very long, hard time. And we're going to help them. And we're going to help the little children, too, that lost all their stuff. Then, you know what this is? Uh, This is very exciting. What is it? Uh, Is there anything in here that's any good? No. No? But you know what? This box is going to get filled with a way that showed God's love. Do you know how? Stuff for them to build. You got it, Asher. We're going to do, yes, we're going to sign this out. We're going to put a child's name on it who can't live in their home right now. And they're doing something very special. They're living with a, a, a different family that's taking care of them. And what we're going to do is get the child's name. That child might be feeling like mm, maybe a little forgotten right now. So what we're going to do, all of you can do it. You get the box and you think of all the things that would make you feel special and loved. And we're going to put these in the boxes and we're going to say blessings over them. And they're going to go to those children so they know what? That God loves them. We can do this. We can do all of these really hard things to help the people who are going through really hard times. And you all can do it too because little children are going through things that are very hard. Okay? And we don't want them to feel discouraged. So we're going to say a prayer for them right now. That's one of the most important things we can do to start. So let's, let us say a prayer together. Dear God, you care about even the tiniest bird. You care about the tiniest children. We would ask that for all of those children right now in your world who feel like their special things are gone, their houses are gone, and they might be feeling alone or afraid, that they will know that you love them and that you would show us how to help them feel encouraged and feel your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can go to Nurturing Faith with Mrs. Burke. Oh! 
Our second reading today is a classic. We continue through the Gospel of Luke, and we've had a lot of parables. Well, this is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of God, thanks be to God. Gracious God, we come to you as sparrows, trusting that your eye is on us, and therefore we can do so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'll ask the, I'll start the sermon by asking a question I ask almost every time I open a book, every time I turn on the TV and watch a movie, who's, who does the author or the creator of the movie intend to be the hero of the story or the goat of the story? We always, I think, want to know that. I know I want to know that very clearly as much as possible from the outset. Well, today we have a story created by Jesus Christ. He's the author. And we want to know, we'll start out the sermon asking, who's the hero of the story and who's the goat? Come on. It's obvious. It's obvious who's the hero and who's the goat. The, the, well, let's start with this Pharisee. This inc- this inc- in er- he's an arrogant guy. Let's be honest. He's an arrogant guy. He pats himself on the back. I'm just this wonderful guy. And uh, he just disdains this other guy. who They're both in worship together. He disdains this other guy in worship. He says, thank God I'm not like that guy. And then... We have the tax collector. The poor, this poor guy. He's beating his breast. He's not even confident enough to look up to God. And he just asks for mercy. He knows he's done wrong. He asks for mercy. He knows he's been a bad man. And he begs for forgiveness. It's obvious, right? Who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? Or is it that obvious? Tax collectors were really bad people. They were so hated in ancient Israel, they weren't even allowed in the temple. It's odd that Jesus tells the story with the tax collector in the temple because he probably wouldn't even have been allowed in to worship. They were viewed as traitors to the Jewish people. They, there was no tax code you could check to find out how much you owed for this and that. And so they were working in league with the Roman government to, and they could take whatever they wanted off the top. And so they were famous for taking way too much and being unfair, and the people had not, there's nothing they could do about it. They were hated. This guy, it'd be like a, 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 
a drug dealer coming into worship and saying, I'm so sorry, I've been so bad, but you know what? Do we really, is it that simple, that quickly? The drug dealer on a dime can just, all he has to do is say that I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry and be forgiven immediately. Is it that simple? The Pharisee. Should we hate this guy? Like we're prompted to do in this parable. Should we disdain him? This is actually the cream of the crop in ancient Israel. These guys were the reformers. They were trying to bring the people back to the faith where they'd been in some slippage. They, they loved, they were... The, the, they were the leaders. This guy was probably the leader of that temple. That it was the, the synagogue, or it may have been the temple in Jerusalem. I don't know. But he was the lead, probably a leader of it. He's certainly a religious leader. Highly, highly respected. And look at what he does. Yeah, he sounds a little disdainful. No, quite disdainful, the other guy. But look at what he actually says. He says, I'm grateful to God. He's it's a prayer of great gratefulness. That's a good thing, right? He says, thank God I'm not a thief. That's a good thing, right? He says also, thank God I'm not an adulterer. That's a good thing, right? I mean, he's saying good, basic things. He also says, I give, he basically says, I tithe. I give 10% of my income to the synagogue. That's a good thing. I think we all would agree. It, it, he he. And he's, and he's all doing it in a prayer. These are good things. And you know, there's actually a psalm. It's Psalm 26. Look at it when you're at home. And it, it's called the Psalm of the Pharisee. And it sounds almost exactly the same tone of what this Pharisee says. It's actually one of the psalms. It starts out, Vindicate me, for I am washed with integrity. I walk with my integrity. This is a psalm. A prayer. There's something off here. There's something that doesn't feel fair. It certainly doesn't feel fair to me. That the really, really, really bad guy does one good thing. He, he uh, uh, asks for forgiveness and he goes home justified. He is the one who's promised salvation. The other guy, the good guy, has led this good life. He's, he, he, he's been generous. He's helped others. He's not done the wrong thing to family and friends. And yet he is disdained in this story. This does not feel fair. In fact, it feels troubling. Let me complicate things a little further. I relate much more to this Pharisee I mean, I mean, I'm pretty proud of some of the stuff I've done, some of the changes I've made in my life. I'm pretty proud. Sometimes a little too proud. In private, I'll pat myself on the back. In private. I guess not so private anymore. I'm a good church-going guy, except for about 20 years of my life. But I'm a good church-going guy. I, I, I... Uh, I, I've been, I'm not a thief, I'm not an adulterer, I pray, I, I give generously, come on. I relate to that guy much more than the other guy, the criminal, basically a criminal. And here's another thing, I don't know about you, but I know about me. Every time I preach on this parable and every time I read this parable, I have the exact same reaction. Even though I relate to the Pharisee much more, I have the exact same reaction. And I say, thank God I'm not like that. I may be a little bit arrogant. I try to hide it. And at least I'm not as arrogant as that tax, as the, as the Pharisee is. I don't say, I say, I do exactly what he does in the parable. He says, at least I'm not like the tax collector. Well, I'm saying at least I'm not as bad as the Pharisee doing the exact same thing. Jesus, like Jesus prompts me to do this with this parable. Having said all of this, and with a little bit of hyperbole, there are clearly some important messages in here. Basic messages. Like, we 
probably shouldn't be patting ourselves so much on the back, or at least thinking that way. Religious pride, being proud, proud of our faith. Well, I, I mean, I am proud of my faith, but you know, you can go way too far, as this guy, this Pharisee does. Finger pointing, not a good thing. At least I'm not like that guy. Judging. And judging ourselves relatively is very unhealthy. When you say, well, at least I'm not like that guy, it takes aspiration out. You stop aspiring and you worry about, you set the bar very low when you do it that way. It takes aspiration out. And disdainfulness and exalting oneself, these are not good things. And yet, on the other hand, this this bad guy does some good, the, the tax collector does some good things. He recognizes his need for forgiveness. He knows he's in great need. And he asks for it. And he does it through this humble prayer. It's beautiful and it's powerful. And Jesus is trying to encourage those of us who feel pretty good about ourselves to also recognize that we need forgiveness. And so in a sense, the way I see this story, it's not as black and white as I try to make it or, or that question, who's the hero, tries to make it. It presents us, when you look at the whole thing and you look at it in a 360 view, it presents us as complicated, mixed characters with some good in us and some not that good in us. We are complex. Sometimes I know I can be arrogant and sometimes I know I can be humble. We're mixtures. The great reformer Martin Luther himself, I think, captures it when he says, Christians are simultaneously both righteous and sinners. We're both. And so who's the hero? Who is actually the hero of this story? And I think maybe the answer is obvious. The hero is God. The one who's willing to forgive the tax collector. Someone is desperately bad guy like the tax collector and also willing and ready to forgive the Pharisee if he'd only ask. And I know willing to forgive me and all other mixed human beings. Which makes me think that this exaltation thing and this humility thing, when we exalt God and we put God, we exalt God as number one in our lives, it protects us from exalting ourselves. And then it also protects us when we exalt God from disdaining others. I want to close with a story that goes, a true story from Brooklyn, our church in Brooklyn. And one of the very, very strong leaders of the church in our earliest days, when Lynn and I were back at Plymouth, also in Brooklyn, also called Plymouth. Um, this, I won't say by name. This man was a, one of the really strong leaders of the church. He was probably the most respected voice. And the church was going through a lot of turmoil at the time, so the lay leaders were very, very important. And he had a say in almost everything. He was a, also very respected in the community. He was a leading lawyer and um, very successful to be admired except he had a secret. He didn't pay his taxes for many years. And uh, he went to jail for it. And when this happened, it was a trauma within the church, an absolute trauma. And everybody was pointing fingers. We were doing, I mean, I got to tell you, there was a lot of disdain happening among the members of Plymouth Church in Brooklyn. And I got to tell you, I had plenty of disdain in my own heart towards this gentleman. And so the pastor did something that was really important, really important. 
pastor turned out to be my mentor, Pastor David. He gathered the church, and during a worship service, after this man was out of jail, he created a liturgy. And he began by asking this gentleman to, in front of the church, as part of the liturgy, to apologize to the church and to ask for forgiveness. And then he asked us in the pews to forgive him and to do it all together. Every Sunday, we pray, God, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We worship a God who is so merciful to each and every one of us mixed human beings. And what he really wants us to do is to carry some of that mercy and pass it forward to another mixed human being. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, show your mercy upon us. O God, make clean our hearts within us. Great and gracious God, we do marvel at the depth and breadth of your love. In humility and trust, we come before you in prayer, longing for your healing seeking your wisdom, asking for your guidance. In the river of your abundant grace, restore us, that we might love your word and your way. Merciful Savior, you walked among the least and the lost in humble faithfulness. You experienced our struggles, shed tears with us, shared our joys. Help us to take you at your word that you welcome us just as we are. Forgive us when we limit your love by our own righteousness. Because you walk with us, teach us patience and help us to temper justice with kindness. Spirit of hope and joy, you descend upon us like a dove, and you fill us with your strength. When we lose sight of you in our daily life, 
when the powerful enticements of the world pull us from your pathways, when we are too busy to pray and too weary to worship, too caught up with earthly things to think of heaven, illumine our souls. Shield us from our doubts, still our anxious fears. Fill our hearts and minds with your grace and strength. Lord, you are mindful of the smallest of your creatures. The very sparrows sing to you. So we pray for those who are dear to us. Tammy, Bruce and Martha, Terry, Edith, Carl, Juan, Tommaso, we welcome Arion Gonzalez as a citizen of the United States. We ask your comfort for those who grieve. Pastor Adrian McLean on the death of his brother Michael. Adrian Garcia on the death of her mother Elizabeth. Terry Marks on the death of his brother Timothy. Liz Castro on the death of her brother Adan Castillo. Lord, we are mindful of those who walk through the valley of tears, for whom hope seems dry. We ask your healing presence and a river of grace. Lord of life, the challenges of the world wash over us and around us, so our souls do long for you in a quiet moment together. We linger close to one another and close to you. Water the barren places in our lives with the healing stream of your love and refresh our faith. God of abiding truth, your kingdom is eternal. Your promises will never fail us. Grant us hope to walk through our disappointments and your peace to quiet our worries. Send us into your world, to your children, as people of mercy and grace. May we tread tenderly with one another. And may our living be a song of praise to you. Amen. near and far, and there are so many young and old who are in that valley of tears. We do it to ourselves. We allow our faith to dry up. We see it happen when the world comes upon poor people. We can be a river of hope. We can be a river of grace. It is in gratitude that we get to come into this dwelling place of God, but also to become the dwelling place of God. It is in gratitude for that that the morning offering will now be received.
gracious God, breathe your spirit upon us and into us, upon these gifts. Take that breath of grace and mercy and hope and pour it out into a world, a world in which many are walking through a valley of tears. And may it rain springs of grace. Amen. benediction for all of us sparrows. Go now with God. Be not tempted to stay only in the safety of known places. Be not tempted to go only in your own time. Choose to go with God. Elect not to go alone. Go in the faith that there's no valley so low, no wilderness so vast, no passage so crooked that God is not already waiting there to be with you. Amen. Please be seated. Mm-hmm.